When I say pause, I mean an indefinite global pause on the development of more advanced AI than we currently have. So, you know, training that takes significantly more resources. What I'm asking for is a global indefinite pause. Before this, I did, I worked at a think tank, a long history in effective altruism. That was where I was exposed to AI safety information over like the last 10 years. I didn't personally work on it until uh, in April with the pause letter, these polls came out showing that there was just wild support for regulating AI. And we had always said in AI safety that the reason that we weren't pursuing, you know, popular support or government regulation was that the public just doesn't understand the issue. It bounces off of them. If you tell politicians, they think you're crazy and you like lose your capital to have any influence to help the issue at all. But when it was clear to me that the Overton window had shifted, I was like, okay, absolutely. We this is the next move that we should be doing. And then people weren't as into it as I thought they were. And so I ended up, uh, ultimately doing it myself, working on incorporating Pause AI US uh, to be the vehicle for that kind of work in the US. The first protest I did was at the Meta Building in San Francisco, and it was uh, against open sourcing of LLMs. Uh, and right. then the second protest, it was in a, a park in San Francisco, and it was aimed mm -hmm. at the UK AI Safety Summit, and it was part of a total of seven protests around the world that were like aimed toward the summit, um, trying to raise awareness of the summit should be about safety. You know, as as the summit like approached, it kind of went back and forth. Like we'd hear a really safety focused message and we think, good, like the summit will be about coordinating around safety. And then there'd be like a message about like, well, you know, we don't want to stop industry and, you know, and like we'd get kind of worried, like don't lose focus, guys. Like this isn't coordinating about innovation. The point was supposed to be safety. So the the intent of that pr protest was to be part of like a worldwide thing and to have that message um, that like the safety summit should be focused on safety. Um, and that was the one where we wore orange shirts and got um, a little more like internet attention. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. The, 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 the first one was more like 10 people in front of the, the mid office giving flyers and everything. And second one is 25. The... <laughs> sorry, sorry. I didn't count. I didn't count. <laughs> For the UK AI summit, did you, did you get like outcome of, of people talking about the protests during uh, the summit or? It was a lot less clear what the impact was there. I was very, I thought, so Meta was the first protest I had ever done. And I thought of it as like, we'll learn a lot. You know, it doesn't have to be a big success, but actually I think it was more successful than the second protest. Um, and that might be because it's, I'm not sure. We didn't get as much media attention as we thought we would. Uh, maybe that was because the Meta protest was kind of, that was, the, the novel like first AI safety protest in the US or first like largest one. Um, and then it was like less novel, maybe also less clear what the conflict was. Like when you're in front of a building, you know, and there's this clear narrative of like, we want them to stop doing what they're doing versus like, we're in solidarity with other people at other locations mm -hmm. talking about the summit in another right. country. Like it might've just been like too tenuous. Um, but I really don't know. I'm not, I have not cracked like what makes the media interested. They were very interested in the meta protest much more than I anticipated. I almost couldn't handle like the level of interest that they showed. And then like, I was more ready for that to happen again, you know, for the second protest and it, it didn't as much, but we got, we experimented more with like different ways of slicing and dicing the images on social media and trying to get that kind of engagement. So, I mean, we, we used it. Um, not sure that like that's the direction I'll continue to go, but it was interesting to get different things out of the different events. You said you had a lot of media attention. Do you have like journalists coming and asking you like what's pause AI, what's X risk, those kind of things? Yeah, a lot of um, I suspect that with Meta especially that a lot of journalists like already had things they wanted to say about Meta, and they just like this made it a story, <laughs> and like so. They came to me and they wanted like my opinion on other ways that Meta had like pissed people off and <laughs> how that fit in. <laughs> so, um, you know, you have to like be aware of their agendas or like what makes um, what makes it news as far as as they're concerned. But definitely the conflict with Meta was more interesting to journalists than just in general talking about like what the government should do or like what our world uh, government institutions should do. Which I'll bear in mind, you know, my next planned protest is at OpenAI, uh, in part for that reason. It just seems like it's easier for people to understand, like, what your complaint is when, like, the characters are also more clear. And if you're just at uh, an AGI company, it's kind of clear, like, who the characters are. They're the activists and there's the company. 
I mean, imagine if like the climate change activists and like the oil company like executives all like hung out together and dated and like went <laughs> to parties together. Like it's just, it's real. It's very strange. Like we're at we, the people who care about AI safety. It's like over this huge spread of interests and it's over this huge spread of like personalities. And it's like a very common like tech personality to think that protesting is kind of like a blue thing and like that's not really for them. And if you're smart, you'll like figure out how to make enough money or like do like a backroom deal. You won't have to like show up. And there's a really big difference between the kind of person who thinks like, yeah, let's just have events and they'll slowly grow, which is how I feel. And then there's the kind of person who feels like it is embarrassing to have a small event. Like if you have, if too few people show up, if your room looks empty, like that's it, you look weak. Like that's, it's, that's over. So you can't Mm -hmm. start that way. I just don't really get that. Um, I think that that's just clearly not true. Like all my organizing has started slow and and small and gotten bigger. but yeah, it just does. There's something that's very like vulnerable and exposing about protests to a lot of people, and I just, I think that's fine. You know, they don't they don't have to protest. Yeah, I like what you said about the oil companies and the climate change activists uh, coming together. I feel like it's it's hard to be on both sides and make people think that we're not doing both of this game at the same time, right? Yeah, I think it's very. So one reason that I thought we so desperately needed like grassroots activism and things like protests is that like for for just your average person looking in on this issue, not like having any insider knowledge, it's very confusing to them to see the situation that we ended up in with AI safety. Like, and it it makes sense, you know, if you were like historically, if you're there, like it makes sense that things evolved the way they did. It was hard to talk about AI safety. You couldn't just take it to your representative. They would think that was crazy, you know? So people, what was left is like, we need to solve the problem technically ourselves. We need to influence the people who are building the AI. And so that's, you know, what, the AI safety community has been geared toward for a long time for like at least 10 years. And, but when people, now that people do know enough about AI and like, it's conceivable, you know, the risk of AI to the average person, they've seen stuff like chat GPT. It's very confusing to them to see people working on safety being like, so in bed with the companies. It's like, do you really think it's dangerous? It's, it's, I, I understand that you can't like say stuff to undermine your company when you work at open AI, but it's getting to the point where that's like confusing people too much. Like they don't understand like the level of danger that you think that they could be in because of your actions. So like things like protests, op-eds, very classic activist actions. Those are things that people immediately grasp, like what you're saying. You're saying like, this is dangerous. We find this unacceptable. And like, and it is very bizarre with most social movements. it, It goes the other way. Like people start by, the most, you know, general ideas are talked about, like, it's very avant garde, maybe to like be a vegetarian, something like that. But and then there's, you know, like effective altruism later comes in and does a lot of like, people working at the the meat company is like trying to change things from within, um, doing it the other way around. And that in the order of like, we start as insiders, and then we like move to outside game is unusual. Um, yeah, and I think we have so much the public, according to polls, is very open to the idea of regulating AI, the idea that you have to slow down. I mean, I could, they're phrased in a million ways, but um, generally it's like between 50 and 70% of agreement with things like we need to regulate AI, like AI should slow down if anything. Um, That's huge. Like, but people just need to be rallied and like be aware that like, this is, this is a position we all hold. (laughs) And um, here are like what the actions we could do about it. So pause AI comes in and the action is very, it's a kind of symbolic ask. It's not, there's no one mechanism that we're asking for, but we're saying like, just pause the development of AI until it's safe. Don't advance capabilities until we know it's safe. Um, And trying to provide like some sense of like, okay, here's the stake of the problem. Here's an answer um, that we might all be able to like come under the same banner on. A lot of people who would be like on the streets or like saying, or at the very least, like writing the most like uninhibited blog posts, like talking about the danger of AI. Many of them got hired by AGI companies long ago, or they work for like, you know, the UK team and they can't say certain things. And there's just a reason that like, basically people who have cared about this issue up until now, like have ended up it with their hands tied in a lot of ways. Some of them wouldn't want to say the kind of thing I'm saying now and not, not claiming that, but um, like some of them would just, you know, want to phrase it a different way, or they really would want to like balance the ability of the government to protect us from the worst harms with, you know, innovation, something like that. They wouldn't say pause necessarily, but um, it's, I think if the public 
realize like what those people actually believe about the danger, they would be shocked. It's just that their actions are not what they imagine that they would do if they knew this information. Um, and I think they don't understand that like, you know, they're not able to really speak freely or to, you know, spend all of their time like calling attention to the danger because they're trying to like maintain their stake of control over it uh, or something like that. I've also, I think the, the risk tolerance of people involved in building AGI is insane. And like the public does not get this. Like they do not like, you know, I, I, Senator Blumenthal actually like became very educated about this after, um, you know, when he was interrogating Sam Altman uh, in the Senate. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, like, and Sam Altman said, like, catastrophic risks. And he said, I, I assume you mean job loss, you know, but like, there's a reason that people <laughs> react that way. He actually learned a lot in the next uh, questioning. He was like, he sh showed off his knowledge. Um, and now he's, he's kind of leading the charge on a lot of this stuff. Uh, so he deserves credit. But um, it's understandable that people, you know, when Sam is like talking about wanting to build this thing, and like saying like, yeah, there's some risk we all die. Like, of course that like bounces off people because most people would think like that's, mm -hmm. we would never take that risk. Like, why would we take that risk? Like you, I mean, your P doom is like, I don't know what Sam's is, but you know, it's like probably like between 20 and 40 or something like that. I mean, that's where like the other tech CEOs are. And he, he, I think that the, the answer is he just thinks like, yes, like it's just worth an insane amount of risk to get an insane amount of value. But like most people if they under if they really understood the amount of risk that he believes that we're taking would think like unacceptable like so um, i think communicating that there's a lot of things that make it very unclear from like the insular tech world what the situation really is what the what the people in the situation even believe and people outside of the tech world have very different values on this they're not thinking it's so valuable to try to get to the singularity that it's worth any risk they're thinking like why do we need this like we're fine like i like my job, for instance, I don't really need society to cat, like to dramatically change. Yeah, I think people have don't really understand uh, how high the pedum of of tech CEOs are because they just don't understand like how somebody could be moving towards something they thought was that risky. I think they're just they just <laughs> don't understand the level of risk these people are like excited for. Yeah, as we were talking about Sam Altman, I, I kind of made like. Um, like a Nash equilibrium, not Nash equilibrium, but like a, a, a game theory thing in my in my head. And I think like for him, like let's, let's say you think that if OpenAI builds uh, like self-improving AI first or like very like super intelligent AI first, uh, he has like 10%, like he can decide how much risk he's taking, right? Um, if he's very much in the lead, like let's say two years ahead of everyone else, like in the best best case, he can decide if he like spends two years on safety, like a month, like ten months, and from his perspective, is like race as fast as you can, and when you reach the thing, you like you slow down as much as you want until you, you make it as safe. So you you like if if you only spend like a month on safety, you you have like I don't know like ten percent risk, and if you spend like ten months, it's like five percent risk. So from his perspective, is like maybe like ninety percent chance of of becoming god <laughs> by waiting like a month and like 99 percent if you wait like two years so maybe that's like the optimistic case of people who are very optimistic about everything and so you end up in this like prisoner dilemma where everyone wants to race as much as you want because if you have control over it you feel like you can decide how safe it is but if, if it's another company who has it you're like oh i'm fucked and and everyone has like now my my entire future is 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 in other people's hands, right? And they brilliantly got AI safety people on board with them, you know. And I, it's, it just this is terrible, but you know, it seemed like the right idea at the time that like somebody should be, you know. I remember when people were discussing whether it was like okay to go work at these big labs, but like of course if they're gonna, it's good for them to have safety teams, right? And it's like good to be able to influence them. But now, like hor uh, horrifyingly, like what has happened is that they've captured the people who cared about it and like gotten them on team OpenAI, and um, and they've convinced. Now I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but it seems like very convenient that people have become convinced that the way to do AI safety is to just is to develop and then do evals, and so now the way that people talk about safety and like what's considered cutting edge is just a form of development like you advance capabilities and then you test them 
And if you do that, you know, in small enough increments, then like hopefully you catch stuff before it's too dangerous. But it still it requires like building stuff that you don't know is safe first. And it's not like there's no alternative. I agree that it, there's not um, as easy of like a, a more as planable of an alternative. You know, there are more germinal research directions, but there are ways to research safety that don't advance capabilities. And that just gets treated like, oh, well, that's so unrealistic because like how it's a business, like they have to keep developing AI. And I think like, no, they don't. <laughs> you know, like, No, they don't. Some people say that like you cannot actually advance safety without advancing capabilities. Like they, they look at the past, uh, let's say, 20 years uh, of, of safety research. And they say that once they started having an idea of, of what human level AI would be like using transformers and like larger language models, uh, we started making progress on like what actually we need to do. And before that, it was, it's mostly like negligible of the, the, the progress that has been made, let's say before 2017. But have we really made the progress we need to make? No, no, I mean... we, we haven't, but I'm saying like, let, let's say we pause AI completely. Like we don't train models uh, larger than GPT-4 for like 50 years. How confident are we that we're going to like make enough progress so that when we, you know, unpause, uh, we're going to be safe? I, I don't know if, 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 if that makes sense. Like, is, is like how much progress can we make without... Without advancing capabilities? Yeah, so I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. Of course, if I did, you know, <laughs> I would um, tell people <laughs> the answer. But um, yeah, so... I mean, it seems like there's ways of looking at like different architectures that are more safe. Um, you know, that would be like kind of back to the drawing board and there would still be a challenge to stop people from using this possibly unsafe architecture that we already have. Um, but yeah, it's not, it seems to me like theoretical approaches might still bear fruit. Um, we might after 50 years be more confident that this is something that we're not going to get an assurance of ahead of time. Like it's always going to be inherently risky. Maybe then we decide that we try to just not build this kind of technology. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, people will often think that's like an unsatisfying answer. They'll be like, Oh, that's not realistic. You can't just have a law in depth. You can't have like a Butlerian jihad indefinitely, but I just like, mm -hmm. I don't know. The reality could be that we can make technology that we can't control. And that when we make it powerful enough, like it, inevitably like destroys mm -hmm. us or like ruins our world and i what right. else are you going to do like lay down and die like i just that that could happen um I, yeah I I, I'm, that, I'm just so i, I think yeah, go, it's go, quite go, likely go it. that giving ai safety like without capability advancement that kind of research the attention and the money it deserves would be very different than everything before 2017 like that was a very like marginal research community trying to to do a very unusual thing. If this, you know, got the sort of CERN Manhattan project type attention that it needs, like it could be very different. Yeah. Um, I think there's like more and more people that know about it. I'm not sure if the amount of traction we got in the past, like two years um, about the risk uh, translated into more people working on it. Um, if there's like 10 times more people were like aware of AI alignment, I'm not sure if we have 10 times more people working on uh, alignment now. So I think that's, um, we, we still haven't scaled as much as, as, as we need. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking about, um, yeah, the, the pause emoji and the, and the, and the, and the stop emoji. So I, I pinned the tweet about the diagram I made, um, which is from Scott Alexander from the, uh, the, the debate. And it seems like from hearing you, the Butlerian Jihad uh, for like a long time is it's close to like a, 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 a stop emoji of like I should say I haven't read Dune I don't know everything that was involved in the Butler and Jihad so I don't want to like be behind it so much but yeah if after right. 50 years of pause there was like no progress it seems more clear that you should stop you know like there's not gonna be right. a way to do it safely um yeah so I say I prefer to say pause and I actually told Scott to put me in stop just based on his how he had divided things but he was kind of fixated on like different like versions of pause that have not become like the dominant name. Like when I say pause, I mean, indefinite global. And I, and ideally mm -hmm. like mediated through a treaty through the UN, like nuclear nonproliferation. Um, there's, he kind of introduced this term surgical pause, which has caused me a lot of problems. Cause people are like, why don't you do a surgical pause? <laughs> Cause we don't know what to do. I mean, like we don't, there's not just like a few things we want to get done. Like, you know, we want to, mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, uh, the framing that I'm trying to achieve is like realizing like, look, it's not, there's this idea, especially in tech and like among like libertarians and gray tribe and, and like EA effect, you know, effective altruism and, uh, rationality types. There's like this idea that like, well, it's their right to build whatever they want. And we have to have this big, you know, we have to have this huge compelling reason to stop them. And I'm like, we have a compelling reason to stop them already. Like we don't have to let them build as much as they can and only like inconvenience them a little. Like, I think it's, it's time for the governments of the world to say like, stop, like we'll figure out if it's safe and like, if this is okay. And then you could move forward after that. Um, so yeah, so the, the number of like different pauses that, um, Scott mm -hmm. introduced, like, became quite confusing because that's very appealing to like right. people who think that way in the um, debate week there was like a few people arguing for different positions and i think like some people were arguing for like a surgical pause of like like timing it like the position is is more like um like posing now or like advocating for a pose now is not very strategic and there's maybe like a level of like strategy of like maybe we we should call for like a conditional pause or like time it at some some point I disagree with this so much, um, which, you know, is a good thing to discuss here. I, I think that the search, the idea of starting the pause at the perfect time, I think is crazy. It makes no sense. Uh, we don't know when the right time to start is. We don't know if we knew when it was going to start being dangerous, we were like, we would have already like solved the problem in a lot of ways. Like you it's, and it's completely unrealistic with the way that, you know, government works. Like you have to start asking now for something that you want almost ever. Like, it's really hard to say like, Oh, well, only when it's actually dangerous. Similar to, you know, the the model of like breaking right before you hit the cliff, you know, um, with your right. AI advancement. Like the idea that you'll know where the cliff is is just like so ridiculous. Like if you knew that, then you should already be able to solve this problem, but just, you don't know where the cliff is. So like I people want me to there's like a sense in which I think they just want me to like agree that there could still be benefits to learning more now and then if we and then pausing at the right time after we had like learned as much as we safely could like would be the best thing but that's not mm -hmm. like a policy proposal we just don't know how to time that and i think that idea is just it's just a gift to people who want to get in the way of ai safety and i it's something that's like kind of theoretically appealing but i think is like a terrible idea um, so that's how I feel about the surgical pause. <laughs> and I was kind of surprised to see Scott, like, from what I remember, like kind of endorse that idea. And I'm like, you know, like David Mannheim talks about that idea and I respect the way he's talking about it. He's saying like, essentially like there, there could be benefits to knowing more, like there's benefits to development now that we could use during a pause to like figure out more safety stuff. But I still think it's like to even suggest that we like know when that point is, is like wild and it just makes no sense. Um, sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that that's valid. Um, I was thinking like most like a, most like a, as a post hoc realization, like now we're in 2024 or even in 2023 after ChatGPT, it was much easier to convince the public or politicians that there, there was a risk because there was ChatGPT, right? And so we can say that like it was better to advocate for a pause in 2023 than in 2021 or 2019 because basically you were you were like wasting your time and energy and um or maybe maybe it would be like just like a much less efficient right so if, if we look at you know <laughs> at this <laughs> we can think that maybe um so this is mostly like about like outreach but then about like ai alignment we can also say that like we're making much more progress and we're being, being maybe like 10 times more efficient now than we were like in 2019. So maybe it will continue and, uh, to be this, this way and we would be like 10 times more efficient in two years. Yeah, trying to like pick winners and the timing of these things like seems doomed to me. I think like what we have now is time to like make our case and we should just make a case that will like continue to be true. Like when I say like, I don't know, if safety got solved, I would stop advocating for a pause, but for now I'm like, we should pause until it's safe. Um, Right, right. And I think like trying um, to be more clever than that is like, could be fatal. Like I, I know, so it's very common. It's actually in, so a lot of orgs that people assume are against pause AI are not, I'm not going to name names because we, you know, talk privately. Um, but they'll say things like people will tell, will come to me and say that my strategy being confrontational with labs is going to hurt this other org. And we really want them to succeed. Like it's important that they have good relationships with labs. 
they don't mm-hmm. necessarily disagree with me, you know, when I talk to them, but they say things like, well, why don't you just wait until there have been warning shots? Because then it'll be easy. Like the people will just rise up. A lot of people have this right. as part of their theory of change. Like they, it's not that they're against advocacy, even if they're not talking about advocacy now, it's that they think that it's just going to happen almost like for free later because of warning shots. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very much not true that like lasting important social movements just happen spontaneously. Like it kind of, it often is sort of good for the narrative that looks that way, but like, that's generally not how it works. There's people organizing, there's like already a network in place. There's already people who are like ready to take advantage of the warning shot when it happens. Um, So I'd say that's, it's not a reason not to start to do advocacy now or to like to wait and have your ask be like only dependent on a warning shot. Second thing is I'm not counting on any warning shots. Like I think I'm concerned about the possibility that like we don't get any warning shots. Like the next warning shot is like the shot. You know? So like, <laughs> it's um, drones flying through your window. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like so that's another reason I don't want to like depend on them. But I also think like a lot of a lot of people um, who maybe you wouldn't necessarily know it do think that like advocacy and like the people, you know, expressing themselves on AI safety, like will be important, but they just have longer timelines. And they're kind of thinking like, that'll be much easier after a warning shot has occurred. Right. I, I agree. But I also think it'd be easier after warning shots have occurred, but I just think <laughs> we need to start now. Yeah. I think it's starting now is good. Um, I also think that uh, looking, if in the future you can look like someone who is um, kind of pre- prescient, People will respect you more, and I, I, if like since I think people in um, that that care about AI risk also care about like pandemic risk. Uh, before, like we got some points on the internet about like oh th- these guys were arguing about pandemic like before like COVID, and um, if we can say like hey uh, I think those models will be de- deceptive in like two years and they might like lie about this problem or or have this agentic behavior, and in two years we have this benchmark and they actually pass it, we're like hey. We talked about it. Uh, we, we knew it was going to happen. Now is the time to like actually do the work. So I think we can do both, right? There's one thing that is kind of important to me is um, I think for me, it's a spectrum, the pose thing. Like the complete 100% pause is you, you put like whole, whole, maybe like every every human die would be like the, <laughs> the worst case scenario. Uh, and then you can have like the worst authoritarian state where like people just like go back to not using computers. And then like maybe the more like intermediate thing is like we don't train large number of models or like large things on GPUs and we stop developing better chips. And um, I, f- I feel like a lot of people will complain about pause thing that a lot of the science, a lot of the open source, a lot of the algorithmic progress will continue even if we stop training large models with, with the same amount of flops and those kind of things. I feel like from a, like an, a normative thing, we can say that like, yeah, we should probably like stop everything, but like from a descriptive or we should think about like what's actually possible to implement. Like what can we actually ask governments before 2030 to implement? And yeah, what would be like, a, not ideal, but like let's say 80 percentile of like how, how good the pause could be. I mean, so the hope was that just compute caps, like, wow, this is kind of a new thing before, like, too many um, companies are at that frontier. I mean, it didn't quite, the best thing that could have happened didn't happen. There wasn't just, like, you know, a fervor. And at the UK summit, they're like, yeah, like, let's just cap training runs. Like, GPT-4 is good enough, you know? Um, (laughs) um, So, like, that didn't happen. But, like, that would have been nice. I mean, a better ask would be in terms of capabilities if we knew Again, it's just I, we don't really know like what capabilities are that are like going to be indicative of danger. We don't we haven't like solved safety and alignment. So, um, mm-hmm. but like you know, asking for you know very like intense uh, testing like tasks you know that um, that a model could do. Like if a model can do these tasks like autonomously like running a town like then like that's not safe. Like we don't want that. Um, you know, uh, maybe <laughs> some kind of high ceiling like that would be. I mean, that's maybe like 60th, you know, um, percentile, like good outcome for me. Um, I think another reason to start the pause as soon as possible is that the pause should be robust. So you don't want to be in a situation where if somebody just gets together a bunch of loose compute, they're like able to make something that, you know, maybe actually it like breaks through and it is, it's transformative enough or it's like super intelligence and it like poses a danger. And that just happens like while the global pause was uh, underway. Uh, if we pause and we're like super, super close to the threshold, then like maybe that could happen. If we pause and we're not close to that threshold, then like it's going to be a lot harder to, for one, like there won't be as much compute because it'll, they'll stop having their biggest customers 
for to do training runs if you're not allowed to train new models at the frontier. You know, hype, investment, uh, development around hardware would reduce. And so like, I wouldn't be as worried. Of course, there would still be improvement to algorithms. You would expect it to get at least somewhat better, even if there's not like a big economic incentive, like legally being able to build AGI. But um, having a pause start early enough means that there's like enough cushion in terms of compute and algorithmic progress so that like somebody breaking the pause doesn't like immediately get us there into danger zone. What's the time frame? Like, is it like in 2026 that this is happening? Like what was the realistic case? I really don't know what, I mean, for me, I pause AI's line is just like as soon as possible. <laughs> um, I really am not sure like what's realistic. Um, the more simple the ask is, the more it seems like realistic that there could be traction behind that ask. And then it kind of gets like, you know, actually going into law, there's like a lot of exceptions and stuff, but you still, I would be, to be clear, the pause AI ask is stop training until it's safe, uh, stop, stop developing capabilities until it's safe. Um, but I think that it would be really good to do anything that slows development down. I would be very happy if my actions led to like a compromise measure that just slows things down. Um, I don't know, something like all hardware is licensed and there's like very elaborate rules about how to, you know, keep up your license. And it's not that people can't develop uh, per se, but we would be able to stop the use of hardware if we got into, you know, dangerous territory. And so, um, so that's, I would prefer that like we, the, the goal that everyone agrees on is not developing capabilities further until we right. have, understand safety, but there's like lots of, there's lots of things that could happen to slow development to give us control over like crucial things. Like in, if, say we get a warning shot, like what kind of emergency powers do, you know, does the U S president have what kind of emergency powers does maybe like a governing body, you know, representative of the world have like, um, it's not ideal to wait till there's an emergency, but to at least have a plan, you know, if there is an emergency, like what can they do? Is there a way that they could like pull a kill switch? You know, do we have like the most basic safety in place so that they could stop models that, uh, appear dangerous? Um, yeah. So, um, to talk, I, as a representative of pause AI, like generally I, it's like not, it's confusing to people like get into this kind of specific because they come away like thinking that I'm advocating that. And so I'm, I usually don't accept for like this sort of audience, but like, I, yeah, like, I mean, I have like a whole ranking in my head, like a lot of, you know, what would be at least helpful, you know, like what would be like <laughs> fine right. compromise, what would be um, ideal, what, and then I think that the most effective way for my position doing advocacy to like help get any of those is to be pushing uh, more of. I think pause AI's ask is still fairly moderate, but you know, something that's uncompromising, like just pause AI. Yeah, just pause AI. I, th I think, so I like the, the licensing idea and um, I think a, a lot of people were um, building these kind of things, um, you know, the, the AI uh, engineers or researchers that train things on GPUs. And I think they have a very like practical mindset and they they think like, oh, how like, how it is going to be implemented. Like, how am I going, still going to be doing my GPU trainings uh, next year? And they're like, oh, okay, so what kind of GPUs are going to be licensed? Uh, like, what is going to be the licensing? Like, uh, can I still buy 100, 800? Uh, can I buy 10? And, and can I still do open source? Can I still like share the GPUs with my friends on the internet? And um, I feel like when we enter into the, the, those, those details, we realize like how hard it is to to actually stop people from from doing what they're doing, and uh, I think I, I think from a, like a lot of my friends are like AI engineers, and um, I think this is uh, this is a, I, I guess their concern is like when you go into the details because uh, it's easy to advocate for something as as a very kind of abstract, but it's, it's harder to like give a realistic scenario. And I, I think the pushback I have is it's not because I think it's bad to advocate for a pause. It's mostly because I'm concerned about how how much progress we've done. And I, I haven't seen any like public statement from the AI summit that made me more um, optimistic about things slowing down. And so if, if you can give me like evidence of like, there's been some progress on, on this front, like I would be like, oh yeah, we, we, we're making progress. But um, 
as far as I know, I did, we, we did. Maybe there's like you know, a lot of like export controls and stuff in the U.S. mostly. But uh, yeah, do you have any like other? Yeah, I mean, the executive order is the thing that came out of nowhere the most for me and made me think like, wow, oh my gosh, like you know, and I, um, I was none of that. You know, it's kind of soft stuff, but it happened like pretty soon. I to me, everything is. I still feel like I cannot believe how much like cultural clout the position of pausing has gotten. And I cannot believe how much progress like AI safety in general has made in the last year, like um, in terms of, you know, just general recognition. Um, I feel this isn't even really something we did, but like the polls revealed, you know, starting in April that like people actually have a fairly sensible mindset about this. Like a lot of tech people assume that everybody's going to want to build AGI. Obviously, everybody sees that like AGI, you know, we could like live in heaven forever if we like master AI alignment. And so that's like the most important thing. But actually, most people don't, you don't have to overcome that for most people, like they're not caught up on that. And they actually have like a fairly sensible attitude toward the risk, like to them, like mostly their answer is just like, no, like, why would I, why would I do that? Um, If you ask them, like, is it worth it to get these improvements, like for this risk? Um, And so like, I've done for the last year, I've really felt like nothing but better about the whole issue and like more hopeful. Um, yeah, to how much is like attributable to, to us or like pause type, pause motivated um, activism. I really don't know. I do have, you know, volunteers uh, that come to me and want to work on stuff. And that always like warms my heart. And that feels very new. I mean, the idea of doing any kind of like traditional activism on this topic, like five years ago, just felt so crazy and like so out of the over didn't know and i really like being able to talk to normal people about it i always hated feeling like i was in like a weird cult um because i knew about this issue and i like thought it was important um it was just so disconnected from like everything that and like they're in the same world as me like the whole the point of like protecting the world is to protect them and it felt very weird to like protect people from something that like they don't even recognize as a problem and like it's been amazing to me that yeah, I can just talk and have just extremely sensible conversations with people basically now that they've seen that like chat GBT, they like kind of know more about AI in general. Yeah. Uh, it seems clear to them that like, if you just keep scaling up, like, even if it doesn't reach like sentience or um, human, you know, being a human or something that like, it's just not going to matter. Like it's going to be able to do powerful things. Is it only for the polls or do you actually talk to those people? Yeah, um, I talk to those people and I think it's good for the volunteers to to talk to people as well. Like I try to set up things where these are not like the highest impact events, but they're like sort of social events where, you know, you hand out flyers and you talk to people about like, what's the risk here at the protest. There's always some person playing that role. Um, and yeah. And then I, of course, like speak to a lot of people on the internet, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And surprisingly, the thing that I always come away thinking every time we do this is, um, just, wow, actually people were like way more familiar with it than I thought. And they got it much more than I thought. Like, I think because it's a, because AI itself is like, you know, requires some expertise to really understand, like, we also like let ourselves believe that like protecting people from dangerous things is like some kind of like, you know, genius level <laughs> insight, like, and, and yeah, most people like really get it. Um, they think as soon as they like understand the threat model or they don't, sometimes they don't even have a realistic threat model, but they're just like, that sounds really powerful. Like, I'm not okay with that. Like, I, I don't think that, you know, I, if we're not able to control it, how would we be able to control it? It's more powerful. Um, so I'm, I usually come away thinking like, yeah, like actually the, the, the basic point here that there's, we're like making something of high capabilities and we don't know how to ensure that it's not dangerous, you know? So like the default is that it's probably not going to do some things that are like incompatible with us. And the more powerful it is, like the bigger those moves will be and the more that like hurtful they could be to us um actually most people get it and so that i mean so so that's not really a sign of progress i think necessarily it's like progress i guess if anything you could attribute this to the warning shot probably of chat gpt but um it makes me feel like much every time i do an, uh, an event a protest i like do something where i'm trying to talk to like a lot of normal people up the street i feel way better because of that do people like understand the whole like human level AI scenario? Like, do they believe the crazy future you discuss with them without any more arguments? Well, I don't make it sound as crazy as you could. <laughs> like, um, Cause I also don't like, to me, the scenario doesn't have to be everyone, like the species is extinct for it to be like bad enough to do something mm -hmm. where it, so like, 
you know, if you listen to Eliezer talk about this, like, I think there's a lot of things going on. I think for one that he like really does believe that like, you know, want the singleton that, that it's most likely fast takeoffs, most likely once you have something that's like capable enough at all, it's going to do all these things to like, make sure it's a singleton then. Um, and it might, inc- that might include like instrumentally extincting everyone, or it might just include, you know, using our resources for something other than our bodies. Um, but like, to like move the needle, like in his mind, it has to be everyone's extinct. Like if everyone's not extinct, then it's just like a growing pain maybe like, you know, and like we do eventually, you know, our, our future is not over, you know? So like all of that, like value of civilization and stuff is not over. I think it's worth, I, I don't feel like that. I'm not, so I don't want to put words in Eliezer's mouth, but like, that's, it, you hear that distinction between like, it's because it's an extinction risk that we're allowed to like take these, this action. If it wasn't an extinction risk, like, uh, you know, like that might get into more conflict with like people's values um, about like progress or something like that. Uh, again, not to put like words in any one person's mouth. This is just like the kind of thing you hear. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that just, you know, making a really powerful entity and not knowing how to control it is like bad enough, you know? <laughs> and so like, when I talk to people, like I'm generally, I'm not claiming that like, def, you know, this kind of super intelligence, like will have the capacity to make us extinct. And like, that's why you should care because of extinction. I am saying like, Hey, like these companies are making this product, which like, sure, you know, it might, you might be enjoying some benefits from it now, but like, what if this happened? It's making a really powerful intelligence. Intelligence is the edge that we have over that's why we have the position that we do like in our ecosystem. If we lost that edge, like, you know, what would happen to us? Like if, if it was just, you know, it doesn't have to be, even have ill will, if it just doesn't know how to give us like what we need and what would actually be good for us. If we don't know how to tell it that what happens? Um, yeah. So, and, and most people are, are very receptive to that. I mean, it's like very obvious to them to like not make a super powerful entity that <laughs> is independent and that you don't control. <laughs> I think people have different thresholds on like how much risk we can take and like how much uh, like, having like 1% of people suffering from like a catastrophe, uh, a catastrophic outcome is, is, is worse than like 99% of people like having a, a little bit better life from like a better technology. And, uh, I think like if you're, if you're really like, um, pro social and, um, like anti-suffering and and anti-risk um you will like be very careful about everything and but but if you're like let's say the cliche of um very optimistic about tech and and you only think there's like a one to ten percent chance of 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 bad outcomes from ai um i think like i see that i see the conflict i'm not sure how how you were positioned during covid but uh as like a young person during covid it was like hey do you want to spend three years uh, depressed in your room, uh, so that there's like a one in 10,000 chance of your, um, father not dying. This is like very bad statistics. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but basically I think, I think I, I see the young people during COVID the same as the tech people, um, for the AI regulation. Like for them is like, Hey, you, you're, you're like delaying everything by like many years and like, uh, being a, being kind of, uh, asking them to be more careful when they think is like, evident that the thing is going to be positive for for humanity and i think i think that's like as much as we talk to them about like hey it's actually dangerous is like kind of your mom or your grandma being like for 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 them is actually 20 percent chance of dying <laughs> from the pandemic and and for us it's actually like 20 percent or whatever doom percentage we, we have in our head and we we can talk to each other as much as we can but in, in our brain it's going to be like a very different a very different like math uh, calculation yeah, and a lot of people in AI safety, I sense there's like a deep like conflict because their values are like that it's worth the risk. It's worth risk to take to make progress. It's worth, you know, job uh, displacement and then like, you know, figuring out like a new order of society, like to have a bigger pie in the end. And like, um, and I, you know, I think that that's d- been true, you know, many, many times. Um, it's not something that I like feel the need to like identify with or like turn into like a precept, which I see like some other people doing, but there's a lot of like pain. I can see people like in AI safety, like visibly pained to have to be on the other side of the like progress 
divide, like to have people calling them Luddites, like is really hard because it's like very morally important to them that they see how much like technological progress, like is really what like improves, you know, it's, you know, that's what you should be working on to like improve people's experience. You should, um, if you really care about morality, you should be like advancing technology, like for the most part. Um, and I feel this, I also feel that like it, it hurts people to, even if they're convinced that like AI is too dangerous, it's like, it's difficult to be on the side saying like, you know, this, this risk is too much. Um, but I don't know. I just like to reframe that. I think there's a lot of like very erudite, like (laughs) thinking on that, that like progress is like one thing and it's this like force you can either like be with or against. And if you're against it, you're a Luddite. I think like, like actual progress like involves like making like good judgment calls about like you know what kind of stuff to release onto the market like making better products than maybe you have to um but there's like a lot of there's a lot of judgment that goes into like what we later look back on as like progress and like moving it and if you it's not progress to like make a shoddy rocket and it explodes you know even if you did it faster um and so even with a lot of stuff that we consider, um, like, you know, we look at like NASA and like this and going to space and stuff and like that, like in history, that looks like progress. Like when you're working at NASA, it looks like there's just all of these regulations and it's so hard to deal with all the red tape and like, mm-hmm. it, you know, and then there's, they still have not zero accidents, um, but they try to improve safety. <laughs> and like, yeah. and it's just compatible with like, I think, what is this? There's this phrase that I heard, uh, which I think is like a business phrase, but it's like slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Like, so there's like ways of thinking about progress and not going like as fast as possible. Or like, we have to be careful not to like allow progress to be defined for us by people who are against pause. You know, it, it like, I think that pause my, like I, the ideal world, um, where the pause, where we don't die, pause gets enacted is that because of the pause we're able to one day have agi that is safe because you know we had the time to do it safely we weren't just like implementing untested uh version you know models and they like went crazy and so i'm not frankly the reason i'm doing it I, the reason that i'm interested in and in pausing ai is to like save everyone's lives but i think that's also preserving the chance to have that bigger better future that that's my take on it. Although I, I will acknowledge, I understand like how it feels to people who don't agree with the risk or have a higher tolerance for risk, mm-hmm. like that it feels like I'm just being a fuddy duddy and like getting in their way. And like, yeah, we don't always agree. I mean, I'm hoping that this just goes to a democratic <laughs> process. You know, I, I think there's something <laughs> about progress being um, being able to build technology that does good things. And if we build like AI that does what we want and understand human value, like. For instance, like an RLHF model on ChatGPT that can understand our instructions and do uh, what we want without being like harmful while being honest and helpful. Like this is kind of progress in some sense because we like know how to like steer it correctly. If if we just have like like a llama, uh, instant sort llama that like does whatever you want and like a piece of malware, this seems less like progress. Um, and there was um, something something oh yeah about regulation on scott's post resuming the post debate he was he was talking about regulating ai comparing it to like regulations about the fda or sf uh, housing being like hey if your idea of regulation is uh not building any houses in sf uh to prevent like bad actors or like bad houses being built or like an fda process that is like super long and and really only good drugs um then maybe it's good only if you um, think that AI is like a tech that will destroy the world, <laughs> because yeah, we, we don't have, we, we 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 don't want the world to be destroyed. But if you think that AI is like like any other technology and maybe will write more spam emails, um, then you think that this is completely dumb to have this like same level of regulation. I think this is like really like how you think about this that will define how you think about regulation. Yeah, and like I I think there's like a few cruxes that get in the way or like what explain like why you would think like me versus like, okay, but the harm is really in like the regulations with AI. And I think usually it's, it's like assumptions about one. So I have a blog post about this, about like sort of 
forecasting from like the category of technology instead of like thinking more inside viewy like mechanistically about AI. Um, mm-hmm. So people thinking like, well, you know, this they always say this time's different. That's you know big economics line. And it's like, so are you saying that like nothing will ever be different? Like, I, because like maybe it is. I, I, you know, I just there's a strong argument for like mechanizing intelligence being a thing that is different. Um, you know, maybe there's a way to to show that it isn't, but I think we need time to like we could at least take some time to like mm-hmm. go through that argument rather than like falling back on this category. You know, that we think always turns out fine. Also, if you define technology in like slightly different ways, like to include weapons. It's not always fine. You know, it's not always good that people developed weapons. It's just we just have this like narrative of like, oh, almost like it was like meant to be like we're like meant to discover, you know, we're meant to progress. And so that means that like anything that any activity that like pattern matches to that, like is also part of that like positive trend. And like it's never caused anything bad enough, you know, before it's always been fine. Everybody who worried yeah. about it was stupid. There were a lot of, you know, uh, <laughs> We have uh, one person that seems to be more uh, pro tech, working in ML, uh, that's requesting to talk. Uh, should we should we open up to more uh, to more people? Uh, I I feel like I've had we we've had a good like one hour conversation. We can maybe open up. Sounds good. Yeah. Hey Yaroslav, you're you're live. Oh great! Uh, thanks for unmuting me. Yeah, so I just saw this uh, thing pop up and I was curious. Um, but the thought I've had every time I see the debates, um, the thing I'm wondering is, uh, you know, there is a non-zero chance of uh, AI wiping out entire humanity, which is infinitely bad, multiplied by non-zero, that's pretty bad. But the other side is, well, what if without AI, we die from global warming or war fighting for resources? So that's also infinitely bad. So I'm just wondering, in these debates, should we also include, you know, talking about how likely we think we may suffer from consequences of other things that provide existential risk like global warming. And and consider that we would possibly lose out on the benefits of AI to protect us from the most. Uh, Right, so we could weigh, well, without AI at current state, there is like a 0.0001 chance uh, that we'll die from global warming. So that's really bad, so we must weigh that against the small chance that AI comes out and destroys us. So should we like talk about global warming and nuclear proliferation and other things that could potentially you know, destroy us uh, when you're weighing things? Should we pause or should we not pause? Personally, I don't think that um, like pausing in the near term, like maybe you know, if we're weighing, should we like never make AGI at all? Um, we should consider like there are other X risks um, and just other other ways that humanity suffers and could be, you know, a, and AI could benefit them. Um, but in the near term, I don't think that like, I, I don't think any other risk is like nearly compelling enough to just say like, yeah, like, let's just make a buggy AGI. Mm-hmm. Um, let's just like rush and just see what happens. Uh, just, I just think that the risk presented by that would be much higher. I see but that's a potential that could change if we get like new evidence of how fast temperatures are rising. Might that potentially change your view? Um, as far as like extinction, I don't think that global warming will make humanity extinct. I don't think that it, the bar needs to be extinction for like caring about an issue, of course. <laughs> but um, but so I'm not as far as extinction. I'm not worried about um, global warming or war mm-hmm. um, leading to everyone dying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's it's less bad than I do see that as like possibly a risk with with AGI and just the other risks, um, just human suffering, um, human disempowerment. Like those are things I see as much more much more likely with with AGI in the near term. I think I have like um, let's say an, an an argument more in like Yaroslav uh, side, which is the basic thing of like if global warming was kind of fast in the next five years we get like temperature increasing a lot then maybe it would be like a worse climate <laughs> to like <laughs> have ai being built in like more tensions but i guess it's, it's all about like timelines of like how fast you think like global warming will, will happen versus like how fast ai is advancing i think ollie and i have this power of ai being quite fast like before 2030 we have something uh, really crazy. Uh, if you just like look, extrapolate the trend from the past two, three years to 2030, it, it looks pretty, uh, pretty different from where we are right now. 
I, I related to this. Um, I get, I job loss, job displacement is like part of what pause AI uh, talks about. And, uh, I personally care about it. A lot of tech people like can't believe that I, that I really genuinely care about that. Um, mm -hmm. I do, um, you know, um, but one it's, I don't, I care about it in itself just because it's, you know, causes a lot of suffering and upheaval in society. But, uh, I also think that it, it contributes to instability that can make X risks more likely. Like we don't want to, if we get transformative AI in the next 10 years and it like kind of locks in a certain set of values, like we don't want those to be like the highly unstable values of people who are like a bunch of people are, you know, highly disempowered from their jobs. They don't really have their stake in society anymore. It's not clear how they like negotiate mm -hmm. their place in society anymore. I wouldn't want that to, to be what gets locked in. Um, so yeah, speaking of like exacerbating causes with AI danger, I think that job displacement and like societal upheaval, people not knowing, like having an agreed upon social reality, like I think all of those things could, while not like X risk themselves, like do contribute to risk. And that, that, could, go, that could go both ways, right? So let's say all the artists now are fighting the AI artists and that they're easier to uh, convince that AI risk is real. Um, let's say they have, um, it, it, it's a very like sad view, but, um, you, you, you can think like the more people have lose their jobs from AI, the more people will be like actually convinced that AI risk is real. And, but this is like a, a very cynical and kind of like manipulative way of, of saying it. And I, I don't endorse the, uh, not looking at the, like the terrible, uh, impact on their lives, but, um. Like, if you believe that, like, um, most of AI automation right now will be from for, like, white-color workers that, um, let's say, can automate people doing uh, stuff online, like designer work or knowledge work, and and it will take, like, more time to, do, like, do, like, the robotic stuff or, like, the AI research and, like, more complicated stuff, um, then <laughs> it means that everyone is jobless in, in two years. But then we have like all these people that like will be able to convince uh, that the the harder thing is 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 worth fighting about. Uh, but if you think that like oh actually like doing the AI research is kind of the same as doing the like knowledge work, then we're kind of doomed, right? Because uh, the AI will be able to like do AI research at the same time it's going to be able to do like the New York Times uh, article. Yes, true. That's I guess a more it's like a safer warning shot. I think like hoping for AI warning shots is like. No, like we shouldn't, but like that, I mean, it seems inevitable <laughs> that this will get this one and it will make people understand like, oh, okay, it can do what I'm doing. It can change the economy. Like, I think, more seriously. I think, I think we got it already with, uh, with GPT-4 or, or ChatGPT. I think all the politicians, people that are, uh, like the Congress, uh, like the, the, the con uh, Congress staff, or let's say journalists that they, they can all see that the thing writes English <laughs> and process documents as well as they do right um and all the programmers can see it because they write code but i think for a, a lot of different things it's, it's harder to see yes yeah, so i'm wondering uh do you think uh, there is some level of investment in ai safety which would make it okay to not pause uh, ai development so if we don't do any safety we definitely should pause it but maybe there's like if we do enough safety research enough resources and I have thousands of people working on it at some level of the number of people, maybe would you consider Holly uh, that was not necessary? I would want to know like what safety breakthroughs we'd made. Like I wish I could like phrase this as like, oh, if, if um, you know, we hit this benchmark, then I would be fine and we'd be safe. But I don't, I don't know what that benchmark is, but I can imagine um, being told like we've cracked it, you know, like we can do full interpretability now. And we can actually like know just from without, you know, running the model just from, uh, you know, weights, like what, what it's going to do and like what, and we can have, and we've discovered there's this like deep architecture to it, you know, where like, um, that's even, I don't know, shed light on what morality is or something. And it's, it's like, we can tell like if it's good or bad. Um, I can imagine there being breakthroughs like that, that make me think like, okay, like, I mean, I guess we don't need a pause or I don't know, maybe I wouldn't say we don't need a pause, but maybe I would stop working on it, I would think that it was like not something that needed more um, uh, of a contribution. Um, but yeah, I just don't know what that would be. It would have to be tied to, I, it couldn't be tied to just like number of researchers or like amount of money. Um, it would have to be, because I really think there's a possibility that the problem is not tractable um, or that, you know, because what we're talking about is like 
do what we want, be aligned with our values. Like what even are those really? I mean, there's like a lot of mystery still about that. Um, I just kind of wonder if like fundamentally can, you know, can there really be stable alignment between, you know, something of our level of capabilities and something like that vastly exceeds our capabilities um, or will, will like the little areas of misalignment like become too big, you know, because of that differential. Um, I really don't know. So <laughs> I'm not confident if, if you just put enough money and time on it, that we would get an answer, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, I think the answer might be that there's no way to make it safe. I see. Yeah, I had an interesting chat with Paul Cristiano pre-COVID, and uh, I asked him how many researchers should we have in AI safety versus other fields. And at the time, he thought we should have uh, 500 AI safety researchers for every physicist. So that's like a nice concrete number you can think about. That doesn't preclude pausing it, but I kind of like those concrete numbers that you can like <laughs> know that you know how to allocate capital, you know, like how much should we spend on AI safety versus other fields, uh, because ultimately it's zero sum game. So you have to, you know, choose at some point. I think that's rhetorically effective uh, to know that tidbit, <laughs> just to give people an idea of like how much more it would take. But I, I would hesitate to like promise that, oh, if you gave, you know, me this many people or this much money, because I really, I don't know if they would find it. You know, they might just like confirm that there's no way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a question about uh, more like commenting on the OpenAI Sega from uh, November, December of like the board resigning and, and all the like thing that surrounded it. And because on, on the some post, uh, you write, you talk about like talking about the spirit of the law of, of what you want people to implement and not um, the letter of the law of like how things are actually implemented in policy. And I think what we've seen with OpenAI is that there's this kind of, you know, governance structure that is, has not been respected at all, uh, or at least like the economic incentives were much stronger than everything else. And um, do you think we're even if if politicians agree on on some like regulation or like some some things, um, we'll be able to like stop this invisible Moloch economic hand of like. The neural networks just want to learn more. They want more data. They want more compute. And people will just like throw more money at it. It's not clear to me. Like, so one thing that people tell me they fear, they'll, they'll either say, they'll say like, one, it's impossible. You can't stop this. This is, you know, they'll say something like the cat's already out of the bag is the thing that people for some reason say to me all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And then if I'll be like, well, you know, I think like regulations have taken hold before in like tough situations where there was a lot of economic incentive, like standard oil, you know, and, and things like that. Um, but, um, and then they'll be like, well, but if you stop it, then like, what if it never takes off again? Like, what if it, um, you know, that was it, like if it pauses, like there's no way and we like lose AGI in our future, you know, possibly for all of humanity's future. And it's really interesting that those two intuitions are so like side by side for a lot of people, like either like you can't stop it or if you put regulations on it, then it will become like so hard that it will be stopped and like humanity or humanity will become so afraid of AGI that it's like not open to trying again. Um, mm. And I really don't know which one of those is correct. Like if there were enough, like if it became, you know, economically burdensome or if just like the, I don't know, the promisingness of LLMs like peters out for some reason, like, you know, after you know, like uh, we have a couple more iterations that get better and then it's just kind of like diminishing returns or something like that. Like mm -hmm. who knows why, you know, um, if that were to happen, if something were to happen to like change the momentum of that, like would there be interest, like enough interest in like doing like fundamental enough research to like bring something else to the fore? Would it kind of die out? Would people, I, it's not, um, I really don't know. And I don't know what's like the appropriate um, case to compare AGI to uh, in the past. I mean, there's like, you know, cases where it seems like a technology is inevitable and like nothing can be done to stop it. And there mm -hmm. are cases where a technology that like 40 years later, once it's like revived is like, you can't believe that this was ever put down, but it was, you know, because for just like random reasons, you know, that made it difficult for the person who, you know, originally working on it to pursue. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's there there's some like you talk about those two cases of like either we stop it completely or the the, the thing continues um, and it's not stoppable and I think people will, will think in a binary way like this thing that is like very hard to stop and if you stop it uh, then it means that we're back into being Mormons and not using computers or or the kind of things and I think 
today, I don't know how much you use ChatGPT, uh, but a lot of people, at least in tech, use it like on a daily basis, and it's starting to be like more like 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 internet or like electricity. And if you remove the language model from your life, like a lot of people in character.ai that use their like models to talk to their girlfriends will be like crying and be like, oh, I, I lost my wife <laughs> if you block the server for like two days. And and this is 2024, this 2023, like end of 2023, early 2024. Wasn't even like two years ago that like Replica pushed an update and like people yeah, like yeah. lost their partners and yeah, <laughs> like it was already like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm like thinking like if it, for the pause thing, like if we go, if we go back to not using AI at all, even even today, I think a lot of people were, would be like kind of disappointed or or sad a little bit or like less productive. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm coding so much faster now. I'm um, so I think there's like some argument for like we should pose really fast because otherwise people will just like be like <laughs> losing their girlfriends. <laughs> I yeah I so this. Like I just informally call this like entanglement with AI. And I do think like, yeah, that, um, you know, right now, like the polls show like very high support for regulation because people like the framing, I mean, I infer because the framing is like, well, there are these risks and people are like, we don't need this. And people, it's a very natural reaction to be like, something is redundant and therefore like, we don't, it's like lazy or something to use it. And like, so people actually like, when they hear about new technologies that they think shouldn't be necessary, they often even have like a withdrawal, you know, from it. Um, so I think we're kind of benefiting from that, like as far as those polls. And as soon as people have like a few positive use cases in their lives, even if they're not really important, like they're gonna, even if they risk, they judge the risk as being much more important, they're like still going to feel like more positively toward the technology. And that's going to like affect their willingness to put limits on it. Um, and especially if it's like meeting emotional needs or something, I mean, yeah, my goodness. Um, so I agree. That's a reason to do a pause soon. <laughs> um, and it's a reason to get to people with the risks now before they just get. Another issue with this whole landscape is just that people think goalpost amnesia is one thing I've heard it referred to as, but there's just amnesia about what people used to think and predict too. Like, remember the Turing test? Who cares about the Turing test now? <laughs> when did we, like, <laughs> like, everybody's just so... Yeah, to, like the Turing test is every day people are not sure whether something was composed by an AI or not. And like, I don't know, we just used to think that meant something or that that would be like a warning shot. That's another issue with warning shots is that people imagine that stuff will be a warning shot that isn't like because people aren't they're either not properly prepared or there's like to like understand the significance of it or they're just already mentally like moved on. They're like ready to accept more risk or they're their model of like what machines can do just has updated and people forget. So like they don't, it'll be not that long before like the American public has forgotten what it was like before LLMs. Like remember when, so when Dolly um, first came out and like we were seeing these really incredible images and there was some talk about like, oh, will illustrators be out of business? But some people were like, isn't this what Photoshop did before? Like they didn't, they didn't know that you have to like do everything mechanistically in Photoshop and that like a human has to know how to do that. And mm -hmm. um, they just like, weren't that impressed by it. Like they already had sort of believed that they, and they weren't able to like understand what the technology meant. Mm -hmm. That I think is a sort of um, a curse of knowledge issue with like tech people and tech people in, in AI safety is that like they have deep models of like what things would mean and what different warning shots would mean, but actually like the public, what impresses them is very different, you know, and like, and they just quickly update and move along. I forgot why I started saying that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just see the, the concrete like DALI output, like the first DALI and they're like, oh, it's cute. And it's, it's like kind of low resolution, but they don't think about the implication of something progressing exponentially for four years. Like if you, if you show a uh, mid journey V6 or whatever version it is right now to your mom, there it should be like, what is happening? That's a photo. Yeah, it's like not even weird because they think it's just like an edited. Oh yeah, yeah. We we like pass the pass the thing where is now is now weird is now normal again. I mean, the only way I know stuff is mid journey is because it it likes certain compositions. Like that's it. <laughs> like, the lighting is sometimes off too. <laughs> yeah, we we have a new a new person, uh, AI safety policy advocacy, Haven Harms. Do you wanna do you wanna say something? Uh, share something to the to the group. Hey Holly. Uh... <laughs> Max and I have been listening and you've been doing great. Uh, okay. He has a question for you. So I'm going to pass you over to Max. Okay. Hey. Um, hey, Max. 
first of all, thank you for the uh, perspective on progress. I really liked that reframing, and uh, I really like uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, but my question is, do you have uh, an ask or a call to action, something that like you uh, want people to do if they're concerned or interested in helping out? Right now, it's uh, pretty general. You know, get involved, volunteer with me. Um, we have a page on POSAI.info for like Slacktivist actions where people can, you know, like get a template for sending email to their representatives, things like that. I want there to be, uh, you know, a bill in Congress that we tell people we like talk to politicians about supporting and that we, you know, tell people to call their politicians to support. Uh, we're not there yet. I um, have a lot of faith and confidence in the Center for AI Policy, which is, you know, working more directly on trying to introduce um, bills that could be, you know, adopted or language that could be adopted uh, into real bills. Um, so that's, I mean, my goal is that we're eventually uh, pushing toward legislation that was framed, you know, with this, with the pause uh, idea in mind. Um, uh, Spinozan says... Are there non-regulatory methods of ensuring alignment control? One reason I think posing is a lackluster solution is that it's re reliant on centralized power. So do you think there's like other ways of getting to alignment without regulation? Getting to alignment? Maybe. I mean, like, because I, I don't know, it, it could be that just we're one brilliant researcher away from alignment, I, in theory. I think for pause, it pretty much has to be government. <laughs> um, I like, yeah, there's nothing that I would endorse to like unilaterally be able to stop, you know, AI progress uh, other than like democratic government. Um, for alignment, um, yeah, I mean, if there's what we've been doing this whole time is like trying to get money and attention into alignment. I just, again, like I'm not, I just don't see, I don't even know like what timetable I would expect for solving alignment. I think it's possible it's not solvable. Um, so I, while it's good to keep pursuing, of course, I like wouldn't um, do that instead of pursuing a pause through government. I think in the U.S., the U.S. election is this year, right? 2024. Uh, we're going to have maybe Trump versus Biden at the end. Like, do you think there's like a better case for pause if, if one is elected versus the other? Well, Biden seems into it. I mean, I was very like surprised and like happy about the executive order. Um, but with Trump, it's like, you never know. I, he did do like Operation Warp Speed. He might just decide like, I want AI paused and like, and do, so, I mean, he's just such a loose cannon. That's why I don't feel like I, I wouldn't, I don't like him either. But you know, I just like, I <laughs> like, I don't, while I think it's possible that he might for some reason decide to take actions in favor of pause, like it's not, it doesn't seem like a plan to me to like support Trump. But um, no, I wouldn't think it was over. Um he might, it would really, maybe then the image of Pause AI would like, or the whole ask would like, depend. I mean, I'm guessing that like EAC would like have more sway with him, but I don't know. <laughs> like, it's got more of like more a sway. macho image. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know that he like likes protesters, but I don't know that he dislikes them either. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think just if somebody he cares, listens to, like is in favor of Pause, like he could just decide to support it and decide to like, make an agency or something like that is the kind of thing that like he could have a lot of influence over. So I would not say guys that it's over if Trump gets elected. <laughs> we should <laughs> keep trying. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of wondering if, if like there was like a, maybe some people can think like reasons of, of, of wanting to push for a specific candidate. If, if they think like we were like in a very bad position, if, if someone was elected versus another, maybe it was, it was worth very pushing for, for one person. Yaroslav? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I had uh, yeah, I had a question. So I'm wondering about you know the concrete politics of pause. So you mentioned potentially uh, sending letters to the representatives. I'm wondering if you have opinion uh, if it makes sense to pause AI, say in the United States, if the China doesn't also pause. Like, uh, does the unilateral pause make sense, or should we wait for them to pause as well? Uh, I think the like general ask of pause AI, the organization is like worldwide treaty um, and just unilateral pausing is not going to be like a, a you know, mm -hmm. a total solution because there are other people possibly still pursuing mm -hmm. it. But I think that the, I mean, personally, I think that the U S like showing leadership and being willing to go first is going to be important with China. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, I mean, I don't, I, 
I don't usually comment much on this issue because like I am representing like pause AI US and I think we should pause either way. Um, you know, I don't think that mm. it's very strange, like the the what this implies about people's like epistemics. Like if they're like, okay, well, we do need to pause, but what if China doesn't pause? It's like, well. Yeah, do you know if anybody is actually working on convincing China to pause? So everything I've seen so far has been Western. I'm just wondering, is it just hopeless or is there like a community of AI pause people? Like, well, like, the, the political them? climate is different, right? I mean, because you don't have to convince the Chinese people as much. I mean, like that's that's mm -hmm. not as much how it works. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of engaging uh, China uh, that's uh, that's been much more successful than like many Western powers feared uh, getting China to to talk about this. China mm -hmm. uh, has its own issues with like so it has sort of a more immediate concern about um, controlling LLMs because it needs to control what they say about the Communist Party, and mm -hmm. uh, so like it's they their development is like somewhat thwarted by that. That's like it's one of the reasons that people believe that you know we'll keep a lead. Uh, for a while, they might not be as keen to do this kind of AI development as we are. Like mm -hmm. they might just feel that they need to keep up is one speculation. I'm, you know, not don't know that much about this by any means. Like I'm no diplomat, but like if it's true that they just feel they need to keep up with the U.S., then the U.S. offering to pause would go a long way. During the UNSC meeting on AI safety, China was the only country that mentioned the possibility of implementing a pause. Um, so I guess like there's like a cynic view that um, might think that the reason why they're saying this is because they want to <laughs> to come back. <laughs> if, if you think you lost the, the race, you might want everyone to slow down and then you're like, hey, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's unclear like how much... Um, like for for the the race with OpenAI, people think that when OpenAI is ahead and I took its regulations, it's regula regulatory capture. But now with China, people think that they're wanting everyone to pause because they're behind. So people have different um, <laughs> depending on the context. Uh, I there is just like I, like I don't know zooming way out. Like I'm told by like China experts and like Chinese people that like China does see itself as a much like wiser, older member of like the world stage, you know, and like the Western companies, uh, Western countries is sort of like upstarts and like th there's some governance philosophy like related to that. And so that like, I was told that like, maybe they'd be more open to a pause for that reason. Like they just, they have longer timelines. They like understand, you know, <laughs> like the, the movements of civilization more like, I don't know how much we need to flatter them, but like there's, um, <laughs> There's that idea anyway, um, but I really don't. I really don't have a uh, special knowledge on that. You have knowledge on the protest because this is what you're organizing, and I think we we haven't talked about the next steps, the OpenAI uh, protests. Uh, what is it about, and when is it? There's going to be a protest at OpenAI, the OpenAI building in San Francisco, on February twelfth, and. Uh, probably like at the end of the workday so we can speak to employees as they leave. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's going to be about um, the OpenAI charter being amended recently to take out the part about not working with militaries and uh, the beginning no of OpenAI working with the Pentagon. Um, and so in general, uh, it will be aimed at uh, the employees, <laughs> uh, letting them know that like this is not you know, when there was like an employee vote on the charter that affirmed, I think, not working with military several years ago, a lot of people joined back then. This was the open AI they were part of. Um, and now, you know, the, with, I mean, speaking of economic incentives, like now, uh, I don't know what kind of process they underwent if the employees were consulted at all about, you know, what's in their, what's in the charter about not working with militaries, but now they will be having military clients. Um, so I think there's going to be a tongue in cheek use of open AI as nothing without its people, you know, um, that like, if this is not your open AI, like you can, you could leave, um, you could agitate from within. Uh, so that's going to be the, the general thrust of it. Um, so like the documentation is not written yet, um, or anything, but I'll definitely be sharing it, uh, on Twitter. And if you want to mark your calendar now, it'd be February 12th, uh, around 4:30 Pacific time. Do, do we have like an information on, of, of, for like why they um they like removed this from their charter or is it just more like speak speculation? I don't know why they like I don't have any details on why they removed it from their charter. I would like to find out. It's possible that people will come forward and tell me more about it, like when I as I talk about this protest, but 
just taking the Pentagon as a client. And then I think before the Pentagon news broke, there was um, there was somebody noticed that they just removed and militaries like mm-hmm. from the statement <laughs> from like people that they wouldn't work with in their charter. Um, so it seemed like something like that was going to happen. So we're sure that they're going to be creating tech for the Pentagon. I don't know what the nature of the relationship is, um, but they have. It has come out that they are working for the Pentagon. I don't know what that means. Like it could mean that they're providing like Chad GPT for the Pentagon, but like they did change their charter to say to like from forbidding working with military clients. Yeah. It seems. Okay, I, I haven't looked that much into it, but it seems risky to organize a protest on some information that we don't have, um, like definitive like statements from OpenAI about what they're doing. And if it's just like, oh, we, we think you might be working with the government and um, or with the Pentagon, and we're not... I don't know. I feel weird, like accusing people of things that we don't know for sure what they're doing and what is the relationship they have with the Pentagon. I mean, are we should we wait till we know for sure what they're doing? Because like they strategically prevent us from knowing those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the protest like works. I was just going to have it more general before um, mm-hmm. it, the this happened. Um, I was going to just try out making it because we really don't have to. I think that I've made a mistake with like having like really news pegged extensive documentation like really bespoke protests in the past and that like probably i could just do more general um you know like pause ai like you're part of the problem pause ai like and we just roll up and we say that and, like, <laughs> go, and you can like you know um so yeah so this one like the actually there is a gripe you know that has arisen with open ai changing its charter like that we don't know how um and taking a military client um so that's going to become like you know, will that'll be at the top of the press release. But honestly, we're protesting them because they're the lead, you know, AI developer. Hey, uh, it's Max again. Can I jump in and uh, say something about the change in OpenAI's policy on this front? So yes. uh, they're going to be, in theory, providing cybersecurity tools, which seems like, and, and they've uh, maintained that they're not going to be using AI for weaponry and things like this. But what I think is really concerning about this move is that they've demonstrated that they're willing to sort of unexpectedly increase the degree to which they're working with the government on military sort of technology. And Mm -hmm. I think insofar as that doesn't receive pushback, then the message is, ah, well, if we change again to be, you know, slip down that slope a little further, then that's okay. Yeah, I think there's a way to address it where it's not about like, trying to prosecute the claim it's like you it's not okay for you to work with militaries it's not and like that's it's not okay like for you to just change your charter that was supposed to it's not okay for you to disregard your board that tried to fire you sam you know and that was supposed to be your stopgap so yeah i imagine it's, it's going to be people can i encourage people to bring their own signs and put whatever they want on them the like overall feel of the protest like ends up not being like as unified as like, you know, reading a press release about it will make it sound. Um, but I just kind of a grab bag about open AI. Like, I don't know what to say about the board, you know, cause I don't know what happened. Um, I wish I knew what happened. It would have been perfect for protesting, but I just honestly could not tell if exactly what I wanted <laughs> was happening or the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so it'll be a chance for if people want to on their sign, say something about the board. If people, um, the thing that I'll mention to, Reporters is like the news peg will be the, the military client. Um, and yeah, and I'm hoping to make them just kind of more easy and replicable, something where people don't need to be briefed on a ton of information to, to be there. They just, they can show up. Um, they, we get drinks afterwards. Um, they have their sign. They either make it home or they make it our sign party. Um, and they're able to, and you don't have to have like a super deep uh opinion or deep knowledge of the issue to just have the opinion that like hey you're like the developer of ai and i want ai paused do, do you have like any specific like ask or like outcome you would be happy with like if you were to meet with one pr person from a ai and and talk about something like is there like some lower level ask other than just like hey just like pause everything <laughs> you're doing I don't know. So I've usually like formulated one of these, but they just, it like feels very performative uh, whenever I do it because 
I know that they're still not going to do it, but it's like, it looks reasonable to like people around me that I ask something. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also like, not the thing that like, I haven't recruited anybody new or like gotten anybody's attention, like through like a newspaper article with the small ask, you know, (laughs) but, um, it's always Mm -hmm. like just with the general idea of pausing. Um, if anybody has an idea, um, (laughs) feel free. Um, I, yeah, I didn't think there was anything like piecemeal, I guess, like, uh, like be more accountable to us for your charter. I don't know. Like, sorry, do you, uh, asking them to like roll back their involvement with the Pentagon would be a small ask. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, uh, and that's a good, I think that's an effective for like the actual protest kind of small ask. Yeah. It seems like it would be like on brand with, uh, uh, like, and you can say, and like promote, uh, like a pause in, and international cooperation if, you know, you have extra words or something. But uh, it seems like if you're going to be out there, you know, uh, being angry about the military involvement, if anybody asks you, then it's like, yeah, like, go back to how it was, you know, a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, great suggestion. Do you do you think there's um, um, value in, in pushing things uh, on multiple days? Like people will, will go like we we won't stop going in front of OpenAI every day until you go back onto your military thing, or are you more targeting like small like events that are like every month and you try to have like a bigger, um, you know, a bigger crowd and 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 getting is is the main the main thing like having a bigger crowd? I've mostly tried to get a crowd. I'm really just figuring a lot of this out. Um, I kind of have like reached a plateau in um, numbers uh, and ways to make smaller numbers go further, like repeating things like a very close succession, like this like, could be great. Even just one person showing up at OpenAI for a long enough time, you know, could be um, good. I think that probably a thing that we have like outsized leverage on is affecting the employees or like, or affecting people's likeliness, or likelihood to take jobs there. Like if it, if it seems like less cool, like a lot of, I mean, I know people who work at open AI and I, I like them and I understand their reasoning for like why they started opening, working at open AI, but they would never have taken that job if there was like social stigma on it. And, uh, something that puts a little more like, don't be part of this, you know, <laughs> like something that really like kind of like puts accountability on people who could decide to change roles or it makes it harder for open AI to find more talent. Um, might be good. So I just somebody, not that many people like hanging out in front of the office a lot, you know, like making them feel bad, like might, might work. Uh, I'm not sure. Like there was like a lot of stigma happening when the entire world was looking at them for the open AI board thing. Um, like, I'm not sure they were like, there are like a lot of employees thinking about, about safety issues or, uh, I feel like everyone was more convinced that like the opposite was, um, was true that like, um, that they were not going fast, fast enough or that the, like the board, that was like a safety align was like kind of hindering them and something. I'm not sure if there's like a way of like pushing the stigma, um, like of, of changing their mind by having, I feel like it might just be like, make them more angry, um, somehow. Uh, at least like I think it's possible. I do think that like I don't know, especially a lot of the people on Twitter um reacting like to I felt like they were hurt, you know, like they they want to be the good guys. They don't like not feeling that way. And um I think they I mean, it seems like OpenAI is an incredible place to work and people feel like super supported and they love it and they really don't want to lose what they have. And like I'm sure that like you know, me like being disapproving is like not going to like overcome that. But I think like it might affect marginal cases if, because right now you, if you, you have this amazing work environment, you make, you know, a zillion dollars, um, you get to work on cool stuff and everybody thinks you're a hero. Like, and like, if we (laughs) took that away, it might not change everything, but like, um, I think it maybe is something that we should do. And it's maybe something that like, you know, with the size and like composition of pause AI right now, like that we would, have you know more leverage to affect than other things. So I think everything is about the public opinion. So the 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 OpenAI uh, board thing, everything was about the like the court of public opinion. And if millions of people on Twitter are upvoting and sending hearts to your CEO, 
and they seem that they're they're winning and and everyone is approving of them and i feel like if if there's like 10 not 10 let's say that case scenario hundreds of people in front of your company uh, but then everyone on twitter is like shitting on the people that are in front they, they might still feel like, like they're winning um i feel like like it's, it's very hard to get a shift on, on people's opinions i, I was um like I, I I was watching those like movies about about Gandhi like where you see like how like the everyone was like following him for protest and there was like millions of of like Indians like doing like marching behind him or something and like it, it's it's when you have this like massive support and like you see the, all the support with like a lot of people and I feel like today we have Twitter and it's like this is kind of our mass of of people saying yes or no and this might take a while to change. Um, as most people were in tech are on Twitter and uh, maybe like you, Josephine on the street is maybe not on Twitter as much. Yeah, that is too. I mean, trying to do that kind of influence is different than my other, my general thrust with Pause AI, which is mostly, you know, normal people from right. all over like and, and like older people and Republicans and so, you know, like all of the people who are into pausing AI. Um, so yeah, the, that would be, It'd be different. I mean, they certainly, I don't think they would feel as like pressured if it's like my like older volunteers, you know, there, but like, um, yeah, I mean, maybe this is something I just perhaps just want like my community to do. Um, but it's, it's hard, you know, like every, a lot of the, the like leaders of the traditional AI safety community do work at these companies now. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I don't really see a way forward where it's just going to continue to be okay to like be loyal to, especially, I mean, I was, I'm not going to name any names, of course, but I was disappointed, you know, to see the AI safety people at OpenAI, like all like tweeting, you know, that like cultish thing, <laughs> like, you know, OpenAI is nothing without its people and like parting their CEO after, I mean, did they know why the board wanted him out? Like that was supposedly the structure of this company was, you know, to allow them to do that. And that was like, he bragged about that, you know, um, but then he just didn't want to leave. Like, I don't know, like just, and nobody thought you know okay fine like I, I sort of understood I talked to some people about like maybe why it made sense to sign the letter and everything you know because you would want to Microsoft to also have a safety team but um yeah but certainly they lost like hero safety status to me I mean they're pretty compromised it's I just think and it's not you know this is just my my view of the situation but I don't think that they're like fundamentally working on like solving alignment or like pursuing a strategy that would like fundamentally make AI safe. And so I also don't think it's like that big of a loss if we don't have people in there. We're already not doing that. Um, so yeah, I would like to, I would, I would kind of like to force this issue a little more. Like if you're really like concerned about AI safety, like you don't, you don't work with the AGI companies. If you, if you care about AI safety, you don't work with the AGI companies. I think that's like, <laughs> that's a good, like <laughs> closing statement. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I have, um, much more to talk about except of more crazy questions about what is the animal advocacy thing of like uh liberating animals uh from uh cages for ai like if you have like any crazy any more crazy ideas and protests but maybe that may be like an info hazard to, to talk about publicly on a podcast or i want pause ai to say like i the line that i have for pause ai is like no disruptions not that i think disruptions are always bad um but i just think you know like we're kind of first to the space i want it to be like fairly i want it to be unimpeachable you know i want what we do to non-violent of course yeah i mean i wouldn't <laughs> advocate any violent uh, mm -hmm. actions mm -hmm. but i would like to maybe see an uh, an organization like further than pause ai that does stunts uh for instance like i do think stunts can be effective um but i don't i, I just, just don't think it should be us i think there should be somebody that is like you can trust you know they're not like pulling like a, a big pr stunt angle on you um that's like giving like the basic message and want to like hold down the fort with pause ai for that for now but i do you know having a background in the animal space like i just think that it's undeniable that like stunts of a certain kind like PETA style stunts like do work and get a lot of attention you have to be really good <laughs> to know how to like use outrage and people hating you like in the right way but it can be very powerful so like you know people I, my whole life like people would find out i was vegetarian and they'd be and 
sometimes they would be like, well, well, as long as you're not like PETA, you know, then like you're fine. And so like they just created the, 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 the boundary and anything they said, like people would think they like updated against PETA or it backfired because they didn't like PETA. But actually like what happened is that their view would like shift without them realizing it about like what was acceptable to do to animals. And that's the goal. Um, I don't pretend to be like a master like that. I feel I'm like barely figuring out (laughs) the like straight up protests that I'm doing now. So Mm -hmm. I um, will not be doing that. So if people want to join 12th of February in front of OpenAI at some time after people work. So in the US, 10 p.m. or 6 p.m. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, 4.30 probably if people are. I feel like I, we we didn't really go technical. Like I I wanted to ask you about like computer overhang or this kind of things, but. Oh yeah, that was asked for. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a couple like things that are meant by computer overhang. I'll start with the thing that I think is, um, a real concern. So algorithmic, uh, surplus it's sometimes called is when, so algorithms will continue to get better at utilizing compute. And so you're not going to need as much compute to like achieve the same model. This is uh important it means that like compute governance which is you know one handle for uh for implementing a pause is not going to be static it's going to get harder you're going to have to like govern more and more to make sure that people can't make the same kind of models because algorithms are going to get better and better at, at utilizing the um less and less compute um this is an issue it like shapes how a pause should be implemented i think it's the most serious technical objection to pause and the reason that people object to pause uh with this is that they're they say that like uh not only is compute going to get like more efficient you know there's going to be more compute over time but algorithms are going to get more efficient and then um specifically the angle with pausing is that if there is a discontinuity so you're not just training models like as more compute becomes available as algorithms get better if you're training models after like an artificial stop then you could get a model that's like so much better that we, you know, our understanding of the previous models isn't really a great guide for understanding this model. And, you know, maybe that model is like the one that causes the problem. So in that scenario, like pause, like directly causes you know, the, uh, the model that we can't control. Um, I think there's a problem with that idea. And the problem, the idea that we would just continue to create that level of compute that we are with right now when there are, you know, customers like the wing data banks or data centers with these chips, uh, that just wouldn't be the case. Like if there was a pause that made training, especially if it was a compute capped, uh, pause, it, then there wouldn't be as many chips just knocking around and there wouldn't be development of algorithms as quickly. So that's why I don't, well, I acknowledge the scenario where um, there's like a sudden jump in capabilities if somebody manages to, I think there, one implication of this is that um, for enforcing a pause, you have to be really careful that people can't get enough uh, compute together to use algorithms in a way that could be like potentially, um, you know, highly discontinuous, something that we're not prepared to deal with. Um, that, would, there's, that would be an implication for enforcement. But I don't think that, that would, the default on like the lifting of pause would be that capabilities have improved so much that we get to these discontinuous outcomes because I don't think that there will be I mean, these data um, centers are the main use of these chips now, like by far. And there's only so many like Pixar movies, you know, that will like keep <laughs> the chip uh, being produced. They also have a very tenuous and difficult supply chain. That's why there's a near monopoly on the production of these chips. Uh, so for many reasons, I'm not concerned that if a pause were implemented, that we would get that problem of the discontinuity. We would still get algorithmic progress. It is just something to be concerned about, especially when you're thinking about using compute as your handle. I think there would have to be also in any kind of like pause legislation treaty, something, a provision for algorithmic monitoring as well, even though it's more difficult. Yeah, I think as you said, there's like people sharing compute. So people like managing to, you know, do di- di- distributed training with like a lot of different GPUs from the entire world. And, and then there's, um, algorithmic progress. And then there's also, um, let's say hardware progress on paper. <laughs> I'm not sure if it makes sense, but like, imagine someone like managed to design a better chip on paper 
uh, while there's a pause and like producing new ships. When we leave the pause, then they will be able to like chip, <laughs> as you know, a better GPU in like two months instead of a year or something. Um, I think that that's what people expect is like, there's like a lot of architectures um, that are being discovered that are like more efficient and, and give some performance. And I'm not sure how much of these you can get on paper versus um, getting them on um, like, like you need to actually like interact with the GPU and like train stuff. Isn't that, I mean, my understanding of chip stuff is that what's holding it back is mainly implementation. It's not like, you know, theoretical insights about chips. I think, I think we, we need to be more, um, <laughs> we need to ask the experts <laughs> about what they think. I have a guy I talked to who's great. He just knows all about chips. I'm like, I shouldn't, didn't ask him, you know, if he could, if, uh, to share his name or anything, but, um, get yourself a person, an industry expert who knows about chips. <laughs> 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 